Let me just kind of explain myself for a second. I grew up on the border of the United States and Mexico, but you probably have heard of my city for all the wrong reasons. Nobody vacations in my city, all right? You go there for two reasons. Number one, to visit family. Number two, to do something illegal. That's, I'm not lying. No, I'm not lying. If you heard about all the cartel wars, all the drug trafficking, all the human, okay, those are all my cousins. Ah. So Christmas was fun or the DEA, FBI, one of them was, one of the initials was kicking in the front door. It's true. And so uh, I, I felt like my whole life was an episode of Narcos. That's what it felt like if anybody's carnal and watches that. So I, uh, I remember I'd, I'd, I'd go, I, I, I found myself, you can imagine growing up in that environment, I found myself with a drug addiction a lust problem and an anger issue by the age of 12. And so, but I love to play basketball. And so I'd go to this church that had a gym and they'd open it up right before the youth service to get all the students into the gym and then transition it to a service. Well, in that transition, I would dip and leave and find somewhere else to play. But the youth pastor got involved in my life and one day he came to me and he said, hey, do you want to go to church camp? Now, honest to God, I had no idea what this was, church, all right? He said, hey, do you want to go to church camp? I said, they're going to be hot girls at this camp. There's going to be five women at this camp. I'm going to invest my time wisely. You know, I was a six-year-old little pervert. I had no idea what he was saying. And, and so he said, uh, he said, well, we're going to go for Jesus. I said, fine, you can go for Jesus. I'm going to get some phone numbers. <laughs> I'm going to camp. What I didn't realize is on the first night of that camp, your boy got saved, got filled with the Holy Spirit, and called into ministry all in one night, baby. It's a game-changing night for me, and ever since then, I've been ruined. Uh, from that point forward, I went to Bible college. I was a missionary in Sri Lanka. How many you know where Sri Lanka's at? Three of you. That's awesome. So I, uh, it's 40 miles south of India. I was just there about two weeks ago. Uh, um, and well, from there, we came over, took our student ministry that has sweeping revival come through. And then I got uh, 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 the honor of helping lead Christ for the Nations Institute for a decade uh, out in Dallas. And really, the last several years of my life, I've dedicated to raising and releasing this next wave of influencers and voices that I believe are going to be holy disruptions in every sphere of society. Come on. I'm talking about medicine, politics, business, education, the church, arts and entertainment. We're taking on all the mountains. And I'm watching how God's raised them up, and we get to do that with an incredible vision as uh, I'm a part of an incredible team that carries this vision at Love Has No Limits, where our heart is to unite the global church for the salvation and transformation of nations. And I'll unpack a little bit more about what that looks like, but there's no way that I could do that on my own. Uh, my wife and I are celebrating 20 years of marriage this year. Yep. No, you don't understand. That's a miracle in my family. I have the longest first marriage in my family. So I'm out here breaking records and curses at the same time. And we have four amazing kids, ages 17 to 7. We have four great, beautiful, awesome kids. Uh, she wants more. I don't. Pray for her, not me. All right? There's something broken on that end. All right? But I can't think of a better place to be than right here at Charleston Church. Come on, how many excited about being in church this morning? Now, Listen, I, as you can tell, I don't do no quiet church. Are you with me? Come on, I'm too Hispanic for that. All right? I don't do no quiet. I believe a quiet church is a dead church. Hello? All right? I believe the Word of God deserves a response. Right? I, I, I like playing on my home court because it meant I had the most crowd support. Well, I believe we should give the Word home field advantage every time and give it the most crowd support. Are you with me? So I need you talking back to the Word today. Can you do that? Church, can you do that? Somebody shout, yes. yes. Say, come on, somebody. Come on. Say, some on, somebody. I don't know how to spell that. That's a big word like mayonnaise. I don't know how to spell that one either. But I need you to respond to the word. Can you do that? Someone shout, yes. yes. All right, I believe it. Do me a favor. Turn on your Bible and meet me in Matthew 14. Y yes, turn it on. If you open it, that's fine. Okay, if you turn it on. That's fine. I just care that you have a Bible, all right? My Bible says it's the Word of God that's living and active, not what it shows up on or what it's printed on. In Matthew 14, I want you to find there, and then if, if you have to put a marker, I want you to set a marker in Mark chapter 6 because we are going to read about the same encounter but two different locations. Uh, I, uh, I was on the treadmill uh, this morning repenting uh, for whatever I ate the day before because that's normal happens. Um, and I, I felt like the Spirit of God dropped this in me, and I might say it several times, but God is longing to be depended on. I think that's real revival when your entire source, when everything that you have 
is fully dependent about God utilizing, blessing, breaking through, posturing, strategically positioning. That to me is a yielded, absolutely incorruptible group of people because they know their source is not a bank account, it's not a career, it's not a degree hanging on the wall, initials before, after your name. It is in one place and it is God's great strength and resource. Come on, can I get a good amen in the building this morning? And I, I felt like this would be a message that I would want to spark something. If, if, and I felt like God erupted this on the inside of me. In Matthew 14, we're going to begin there, but find in Mark chapter 6, because two, two locations but the same encounter. I, have a, I, I feel like Mark keeps things supernaturally real, and so he keeps it 100 all across. And so there is one verse I want to draw our attention to in the book of Mark, but we're going to begin eating right here in Mark, Matthew 14. Jesus has just finished feeding uh, the 5,000, and as soon as they're done picking up the leftovers, God in the flesh does something very unusual. It says this in verse 14. Uh, I'm sorry, in verse 22. It says, immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side. Everybody say the other side. The other side. While he sent the multitudes away. Everybody say the other sides. I, you know, I believe there is an other side. Some of you came last weekend and met Jesus for the first time. And the last seven days, you've had the best sleep. You've had the best peace. You've had the best joy. You've had the best of the best. And friend, it only gets gooder and gooder and gooder. It's because you have gone to the other side. I, I, would, I, I would like to prophetically declare this over your life, that there is an other side to your pain. There is an other side to your frustration. There's an other side to the doubt. Are you following me? There is an other side. But I got news for you. You can't bring everyone with you to the other side. Now let me help you out. It's amazing how, you know, when you were B.C. before Christ, you could find 10 people to go get drunk with. But you can't find one person to go to church with. You could find 20 people to go to the club with or get in trouble with, but you couldn't find one person to pray you through. Friend, if that's still your surrounding and circumstances, I got news for you. It's time to go to the other side. But Charleston, you are on fire right now, and I would like to tell you that it's time to go to the other side. And you cannot just bring everyone else with you. You can't bring everything with you. You can't bring all your failures, all your problems, all your issues. But friends, you cannot bring all your wins. All your successes, all your breakthroughs, because I've watched trophies turn to anchors real quick in people's life, and then they get stuck in an outpouring that happened 40 years ago, and they spend their entire life trying to get back to that outpouring and not realizing there is a fresh outpouring for today. Come on, God wants to do something in Maine that's never been seen, never been done, but we have to go to the other side. He says... He's going to send them to the other side while he sends the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up on a mountain by himself to pray. Now, when evening came, he was alone there. Watch this. But the boat was in the middle of the sea. Church, what was in the boat? Or what was in the middle of the sea? The boat. Where was it? Where was it? What was in the middle of the sea? I just want you to remember that. The boat was in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. But watch this. Now, the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them walking on the sea. It's right here. I want to interject Mark chapter 6, verse 48. Remember, it's the same encounter. Two different locations. But Mark adds something. Look at this in verse 48. It says, Then Jesus saw them straining and rowing, for the wind was against them. Now, about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. Watch this. And would have passed them by. You see, you see that right there? Does that not spiritually frustrate anyone else? God's like, I see them on the struggle bus, not even plan on stopping. This is un-American of Jesus. I see you straining. I see you struggling. I see you fighting. I see you contending. You don't need me to stop. It is real quiet up in this spirit filled room. All of a sudden, people are like, wait a minute. Right? Watch this. Jump back to, I just want to make sure you saw that. Verse 48. Sees them struggling, came walking in the fourth watch of night, and would have passed them by. Didn't even have an intention on stopping. Jump back to Matthew 14. Let's go right into verse 26. It says, And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It's a ghost! 
as they cried out for fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, be of good cheer, it is I, do not be afraid. Verse 28, and Peter sent, answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. So he said, come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when the wind was boisterous, he was afraid and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand, caught him and said to him, oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. Then those who were in the boat came and worshiped him saying, truly you are the son of God. Man, there is so much here, and we're going we're gonna to taste it all like a bucket of chicken, all right? But first, let's pray. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, I ask for the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Jesus Christ to flood every heart and every life right now. Father, I speak to this atmosphere, and I say that you are full of faith. You are full of hope. You are full of peace. You are full of joy. I come against every limit, every restriction, every barrier, every lie, every demonic harassment. I say is broken right now in Jesus' name. And I call every man and every woman, I call them in to their season. I call them in to their rhythm. I call them in to their strength. I call them in to their identity, God, that this day marked and consecrated as Revival Sunday, that everybody does, that every Everyone leaves different. No one leaves the same. That in this moment, God, we arrest our attention. We consecrate our hearing. We open up our hearts a little bit wider. We renew our minds a lot more, God. That you would punch a hole in the roof so that heaven can invade in a way of my life. That cancer falls off bodies. That throat cancer leaves. That asthma is gone. That infertility is done away with. That breakthrough financially comes. That revelation that surpasses human understanding would be delivered on time in effect God that you would move like never before we want a fresh outpouring God we want fire from heaven a historic fiery outpouring that the nation has never seen God we want the same fire that you answered with on Elijah's mountain in Mount Carmel we want the same fire that Moses looked at in a burning bush we want to be in the fire like Shadrach Meshach and Abednego and not even smell like smoke God send your presence undo and redo overwhelm God supersede excessively in our life God in the mighty name of Jesus and everyone shout it amen. amen amen I feel like praying this morning I want to speak to you from this subject I want to talk to you about being born for the storm it's kind of funny when you think about what you lived through the last three days some of you that's like a slow Thursday for the rest of the country it's like Armageddon a nor, nor, nor'easter, is that how you say it? A nor'easter? I'm not from here, you can tell. All right, so, like, I, I remember Matt's like, yeah, they're shutting down the state. I'm like, who does that? They're, he's like, Maine. <laughs> but I really feel like there are challenges, obstacles, opposition that you were born for. There is opponents, spiritual giants considered enemies that only you your prayer life and the gift and grace of God on your life can actually take down because you are born for storms. And God will put us in these unexpected, completely unscripted, was never anticipated situations so that we could get to the end of our experience and our strength and we would find a supernatural gear we didn't know we had and we would realize we can take on giants we can cause city walls to fall. We can cause principalities to bow down. And not even storms could stop a fully believing church. Come on, do I have a witness in the room? It's time that we're born for the storm. I remember one time I created one of these storms for one of, uh, my, one of my daughters. Um, at, 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 at Christ the Nation, we used to host a, a week-long conference of Voice of Healing. And it was my job to host it. And I wasn't just doing that on stage like I am here. I was also running back to our studio to do it uh, uh, on TV because we had connected with, a, uh, collaborated with a um, TV station network. And I asked the founder, I said, hey, how many 
homes is this going to reach? And he said, Chris, this will reach 700 million homes. That's over a billion people on planet Earth. So immediately I'm like, okay, we've got a window, a sacred window here. And so I remember we had a great week. Well, about thir- Wednesday, Thursday, my oldest daughter comes to me and she says, Dad. She's like, Dad, I miss you. We- you've not been here. I miss you. I said, baby, I miss you too. I said, you know what? Why don't you come with me tonight? you spend the whole day. And then tonight we'll be on TV together and we'll just have a whole day to ourselves and, and get some time. And she's like, all right. I said, but now listen. Her name's Jasmine. I said, now listen, Jazz. I said, this is, this is serious because it's going to be on TV, and it's 700 million homes. It's a billion people on planet Earth that are going to be listening to you, so I need you to come ready. She's like, Dad, I'm ready. I'm so ready. I'm ready. I was like, okay, no problem. She's like six or seven at this time, all right? And she's, no lie, she's always been ahead of her age. She's more mature than two of me. I promise you that, all right? And so I remember we're on the car, and I'm like, Jazz, now listen, 700 million homes, a billion people are going to be watching your baby teeth tonight, and I need you to bring your A game. She's like, Dad, bet, I'm ready, right? I'm like, okay. Then we get into the green room. I said, now, Jasmine, listen, I'm not trying to put any pressure on you, but it's 700 million homes, it's a billion people. And you're an Estrada, and we don't pray no weak prayers, and we don't do no low grade ministry. She's like, Dad, chill, I'm ready. We get in the studio, and I turned to her and I said, Jazz, I'm not nervous, but listen, 700 million homes, <laughs> there's a billion people on planet Earth gonna be listening to you, and you need to pray with some strength. Come on, some strength. She said, Dad, I was, I'm so ready. I was ready yesterday. That's how ready I am. All right, bet. Then they start saying, 30 seconds. I'm like, Jazz, now listen, this is 700 million homes. This is a billion people, billion with a B, girl, all right? And I need you to pray with some authority. They said 15 seconds. I said, Jazz, are you ready? She says, Dad, I'm not ready. I don't want to do this. Dad, I don't want to do this. Then they start counting down. 10, 9. Then she starts, Daddy, please. Daddy, please don't make me. Crying, shaking. Dad, please, I don't want to do this, Dad. I'm scared, Dad. Now, I am the type of parent that if you say you're going to do something, you are going to follow through. And I don't care if 700 million homes, a billion people are going to watch a crying seven-old girl on Christian television, all right? So she's like, Daddy, please. I'm like, no, you're going to do it. Because if you commit, you're going to follow through with your commitment. You know what that's called? Good parenting, right? So I'm sitting there. She's like, Daddy, please. I've got the director, the producers, cameraman. I've got everybody, assistants in the room. They're like, what do we do? What do we do? Lighting's on, and they're counting down. Five. Four, Daddy, please don't make me do it. And they start counting. Three. And then, sure enough, the red light comes on. Hey, everybody, thanks for watching tonight, man. It has been a powerful week so far. And to close it out, I got somebody special with us tonight. I have my daughter, Jasmine, with me. Jazz, hasn't this been an incredible conference? And she goes, oh, my gosh, Dad, it's been so good. Every session has been absolutely powerful. And I said, Jess, there's some people who need a a healing touch. Why don't you pray for some people? And she goes, okay. And she goes, Father, and she's yelling, she's like yelling this, all right, shouting it. Father, in the name of Jesus, I command the peace of heaven. And I said, wow, Jess, that was strong. She says, yeah, somebody totally got that. I felt a good release on that. Someone totally got that. I said, hey, thanks for watching tonight. We'll catch you guys later. The night goes off and she goes, I can't believe you made me do that. <laughs> she didn't talk to me for two days. She avoided, if I was coming down the hallway, she went ducked in the room. It didn't matter if it was a closet. All right, she didn't talk to me. But what Jasmine was learning is what I've had to learn many times, is what many of us are probably learning right now, is that God, our loving Father, will never set you up to fail. But he will stretch you. And he will challenge you, and he will grow you, and he will give you assignments you were never trained for, you don't have a degree in. He will give you targets that you don't have enough money for, that you don't know the right people, that you don't know what you're doing. And the only thing you have is this inner voice that's been guiding you to this place of desperation that collides with anointing, and that's where breakthrough happens. And friends, That is how storms get solved. Issues are brought down. Idols are torn down. It's those of us who understand, I'm born, I'm built, I'm chiseled for storms. God loves to be counted on. He loves to be depended on. It's almost as if when we don't get an immediate breakthrough, we start doubting, did I hear God? We have incredible amounts of faith and belief for 
instant miracles. But what about the process? What about the journey? What, what happens when A to B is longer than you expected? What happens then? Do you give up on storms? Does the assignment get lifted off of you and have to be put on another and you will stand before the judgment seat of Christ and have to answer for that? You have to be born and ready and understand, I, this is not because I was the only one that said yes. This is because God formed me and he knew the assignments on my life. He knew that this injustice would irritate me. It would spiritually frustrate me. And if something is bothering me on that deep of a level, I must have an assignment. I'm probably called to it. I'm probably built for this storm. I am born for opposition. I am born for challenges. I was forged in a fiery furnace of God's red hot love for me that would cause me to take on governments, palaces, issues, hundred year old problems and curses. Perhaps this could be the hour. I don't know about any of you, but I think we're entering the greatest decade of ministry and harvest since the death, burial, and resurrection of Lord Jesus Christ. I think a lot of us think that darkness is beginning to have a, a upper hand and the moral fiber, moral fiber and fiber of our uh, 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 fiber of our our nation is being torn beyond repair. But friend, light shines better in darkness. It's only going to get brighter and brighter and brighter from here. And the answer and the solution, I promise you, is not a voice with a microphone. It is not the anointed ones. It's not government. It's not education. I promise you, the only hope of the world is the Lord Jesus Christ's bride, the local church. Because anytime God wanted to sustain transformation, it didn't happen through government. It didn't happen through education. It always has been. The data is there. It's always been the local church. When pestilence and disease runs rampant, everybody leaves. Guess who stays? The local church. When wars start to break out, everybody's gone. Guess who stays? When the world wanted a better system of government, the church gave it to it. When the world wanted a better school system, the church gave it to it. When the world wanted better hospital, I can go down a whole list. It's always been, we've been born for this. And if we're going to be born for the storm, let me give you three things. Number one, walk where he walks. Walk exactly where he tells you to walk. I believe a lot of us, we have only accepted possible assignments, but not impossible assignments. I've got great news for you. It's time to upgrade. It's time to level up. It's time to throw on some spiritual gains and some muscle so that you actually start doing something beyond your own family life. So that families you will never meet and grandkids you might never meet will actually have a hovering cloud of glory around it that there would be a great renewal, a third great awakening, a great spiritual shaking that begins to take place. And that all happens if we walk where he tells us to walk, walk exactly where he tells us to walk. This, this is what I love. You have to understand Peter in this text is not Apostle Peter. He's barely disciple Peter. This guy's still Fisherman Peter. All right, so Fisherman Peter, you have to understand fishermen in this day, knowing the historical value of the text, you have to understand that fishermen always looked at the sea as an enemy. And they were always in the struggle and at war with their enemy because the enemy determined how many fish they got. The enemy determined if they could feed their food or grow their business. You understand, this is how the enemy would come. And so they always viewed the water, the sea, as an enemy. So when Peter is seeing this, he's not reading this like we do from a third person. He is seeing this through the filter of a fisherman. And what he is seeing is not Jesus defying science, physics, and gravity. He is seeing Jesus walk on his enemy. Oh, I'm preaching better than some of you saying amen. I'll tell you, that, it's probably too cold outside. I, I, he, he sees Jesus walking all over his struggle. This guy is walking on my frustration. Jesus is out there like. And Peter's like. Is that him? Is that him right there? I'm telling. Can you imagine the internal turmoil? 
He's never seen this before. And what I love, you know, the first form of writing, really, some would say, would be the Egyptian hieroglyphics. Do you know the picture for the word impossible is a man walking on water? And Jesus is doing the impossible as if it was normal. As if this was custom. As if if he took a boat, it would be dishonoring to the anointing that's on his life. And he sees Jesus is walking. I, said, I think sometimes we think only God can step over a pebble in our life, yet Jesus is like, I form mountains. I told the sea you can only come this far. I put the stars in the sky. I stretched them between my hands. I can tell the moon to do this. I can tell the sun to do this. If I want it to stand still so that my people can get a win, we're going to get that dub, and I'm going to cause the sun to stand still. This is what happens when you walk where he tells you to walk. Jesus is walking. Now, this, this is where the Christian TMZ messes it up. This is where the haters come in. This is where we don't understand the context because when somebody preaches this, they're like, yeah, Peter gets out of the boat. Peter's like, Lord, if it's you, command me to come. Jesus says one word, come. He gets out of the boat and he starts to walk. He sees Jesus walk all over, his enemy, that, all over his enemy, and that inspires him. Maybe I could actually do the same thing. And he starts out walking all over his enemy. I got news for some. You're going to walk all over the cancer. You're going to walk all over the deficit. You're going to walk all over the pain. No, your babies are going to come back to Jesus. I promise you. You just keep walking on your water and don't worry about anybody else. He just keeps walking. But then... Most people say, well, and Peter drowned too. That's not, that's not what it says, dog. That ain't what it says. Well, Peter drowned too. That's not what it says. It says he began to sink. Now, I, this is where people are like, yeah, he walked on water, but he drowned. You know, if my haters were talking all this, well, you walked on the water. Peter, you walked on the water, but you began to drown too. Like, if they were to say that, I would have been like, wait, 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 well, listen. I, I may, like, I may have begun to sink or drown, but at least I was close enough to Jesus that all he had to do was reach down and pick me up. Where were you? You were still comfortable in your boat full of opinions and theologies and strategies and one-liners and stances and knowledge, and I was out here walking on the water when I shouldn't have been. Walk where he tells you to walk. You know, I, I, uh, I think Peter needed to sink. I know this doesn't preach well. But you know, when, you, when, you, when you're walking on water, life is great. It's not faith that grows. This is where spiritual, lethargic prayer lives happen. You want to know where revival loses its fire? It's when everything is so good and there's no fresh risk there's no fresh challenge. There's no new giant. And now we're like, well, we, we peaked. You will never peak. You're not on the 30-year encounter plan here. There's no arrival point up in this thing right here. He's just, you know, I think a lot of times I've watched a lot of people, they, they get it good, like when they're candidates in the White House. And then they start praying or stop praying. It is real quiet up in Maine. <laughs> I, I, listen, I, I, loved, I, I loved certain candidates more than the other, but I watched in my own life where, well, they're now in, so I don't have to pray about that anymore. No, we have to pray more. Yeah. We're being trusted with more. Yeah. Breakthrough always leads to more responsibility. Yeah. Walk where he tells you. I, I think Peter needed to sink because if he hadn't, he wouldn't have realized that Jesus was constantly going to be there to pull him out of his water. It, it, I, I think it's important. Sometimes we only preach one side of Jesus. Sometimes we preach him just as the lamb. He's the lamb. He's the, you know, he's the good shepherd. He's the lamb. He throws us over the shoulder. But he's not just a lamb. He's a lion too. There's something about walking where he was. Sometimes it's a peaceful walk. Sometimes it's a war path. But baby, you better walk where he tells you to walk. Here's the second thing. If we're going to be born for the storm, number one, walk where he tells you to walk. Number two, learn to live in the middle. Learn to live 
in the middle. You know, I, I, I think uh, we don't like the middle of anything unless it's an Oreo. <laughs> I'm not lying. Like, we like starting. Come on, you know what it's like when you get fresh vision and excitement. You got strategy. You got your plans. You know what I'm saying? And then you start out, and you're full of momentum, and you'll take on a few resistance moments. You're just like, let's plow through. But then you get to the middle. And then we, we love ending because we somehow survived the middle, and all we want is relief. And every pastor on staff here said amen <laughs> after an Easter week. It's really quiet, but there's some hesitance. Like, <laughs> That's real. Like, there, there's something about, we love starting, we love finishing, but we hate the middle. We, we don't like the middle. I remember one time I was in, um, where was I? Oh, Guatemala. I was in Guatemala, I was preaching at a pastor's conference, and I was, um, I was staying at a, 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 they brought me to have breakfast at the pastor's house, and I'm sitting, beautiful home, I'm sitting in there, they, they, had, they just had me sit at the table, well, he had a bunch of people coming from the church and serving, and, and they were getting the breakfast ready. I got there early, and so I'm sitting there, and all of a sudden, I kid you not, Pastor Ward, Pastor Matt, what do I call you, Bishop, Jedi Master, what I, okay. So, like, you never know, head Levite, Shafai player, I don't know what to call you. So, like, all of a sudden, I'm sitting at the table, and it starts shaking like this, on its own. Now, I don't know what tables do in Maine, but I know what they do where I'm from, and they don't do this on their own. So you ever had something so weird happen that you're like acting like it's not happening and you're just ignoring like, ha, 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 ha. <laughs> it's not happening. <laughs> like you ever had that? But it starts to get even worse. It starts to like moving. Oh, I broke something. Oh. <laughs> you got wheels on this thing? I just noticed that. Just holy roller. All right. So, <laughs> so wait, it's just, I've never seen one with wheels. You should put some rims on there or something like that. <laughs> I ain't never seen that in my, I preach everywhere, I never seen that. I knew I liked this church. I'm telling you, this thing starts shaking. I mean, violently shaking. And I'm, and I'm getting nervous, because I grew up in the hood, things don't shake, unless something exploded, all right? So like, you're sitting there, and things are shaking, and things are moving, and everything's shaking. So I don't know why I thought this. I, don't, I still to this day, I don't know why I thought this. Uh, there was a banana on the table. I thought, man, if I grab this banana, it'll stop shaking. So I, I grabbed me this banana. But I'm sitting there shaking in the banana. I'm doing this. I thought, man, if I eat the banana, this is how stupid I am. I have the spirit of stupid sometimes, right? So I remember if I eat the banana, everything will start shaking. So I'm sitting there peeling the banana and I'm trying to eat it, but I'm getting banana all over my mouth. I can't even get it in my mouth. I'm shaking like this. Chandeliers are shaking, cupboards are clapping. I mean, it's violent shaking. And finally, I just yell, hey! Doesn't anyone else notice stuff is moving up in here? And the pastor leans back, no lie, leans back like this. He goes, oh, Pastor Chris, that's not even a 5.0. We're good. And goes right back in. I'm thinking, what? You know, why, why was his response a lot different from my reaction? He had been through the middle of one before. This is what I love about middle people. Middle people don't throw stones. Middle people aren't critical or cynical. Middle people aren't afraid of their scars. Listen, I'm, I'm, all, listen, I'm all for you having a great season and hitting a home run, but, man, let me tell you, there's some real ones in this room that didn't always hit bat a 1,000. That it, had it not been for God, had it not been for God overriding time, space, physics, gravity, everything else, we, you, I, maybe all of us would not be here. I think there's a lot of us, see, you know, we, we, we feel like, man, I want to I wanna have everything ready. I want to have it all ready. We, in America, we are too addicted to being ready. We want to have all the money first. We want to have all the calendar dates locked in. We want to have all the relationships first. We want to have all of this first, everything first. Can, that never happens. Not in the church, not in the business world, not in the education system, nowhere. That never happens. I want to be ready. Pastor Chris, I want to be ready. Have you read this thing? This is not full of, this is not a book full of people that had a plan. Hey, hey, Noah, hey, listen, Noah, listen. Build a boat where there's no water. Build a boat. Right? Hey, David, listen, D. Go kill a giant, but don't wear any armor. Trust me. Trust me, trust me. Right? 
Moses, hey, Mo, listen. Just talk to the rock. Water going to come out that rock. Water going to come out the rock. Water going to come out the rock. Either you took too much of what you should be selling. Or you heard God. Abraham was too old. Gideon was too scared. Mary was still single. This is not about being ready. And we want everything lined and filtered. It's amazing to me. You know, like I've heard this passage preached from multiple angles. Being in a Bible college for many years, still I am. You, you like, you know, you, you hear this, con- this passage come up. It's a great passage. It's full of faith. It's full of excitement. It's full of challenge. But I, I've heard it preached from every angle. If you want to be a great preacher, you know, uh, um, uh, homiletically, you want to give everything a voice. So, like, if the storm could talk, what would the, the storm say? If the water could talk, what would the water preach? Right? You want to give everything a voice. So, what I have never heard, though, is if the boat could talk, what would the boat say, Dalton? What would the boat say? So, we're going to have some boat talks up in here. This, not boat talks for all the fake plastic people. I'm talking about boats talking. Just, some people are like, free samples? We have an office in Orange County. This is life, all right? So we have some boat talks. You know, the Bible says, it's very clear in verse 24, it says, now the boat was in, church, the boat was in, the what? The middle. It's interesting because the Bible gives us a geographical location in the New Testament, which doesn't always happen in these circumstances. And it is in the middle of the Sea of Galilee, which if I remember correctly, It's about seven miles long and about three to four miles wide, and they're crossing the width of this, and they are now in the middle. Now, no doubt, this boat is full of all kinds of people. There are fishermen who are used to rough seas. There are tax collectors who have never even been in a boat. So, no doubt, people who haven't been through the middle are freaking out, which is the majority of this boat. We fit in the dock. We fit in the dock. We're going to die. We're going to drown. We're going to drown. Right? And so now people are like, let's turn it back. And so they're thinking possibly maybe, I know he said the other side, but maybe, maybe we should just rework the budget so the church can. Oh, you don't want, to, you don't want me to go that far? That's okay. I get on a plane later. I'm good. And don't let these pants fool you. I'll fight everybody in this room. I'm safe, but I'm not soft, baby. All right? Like, I know he said we're going to go to the other side, but, you know, if the youth ministry, if the worship pastor, if Pastor Ward would just, I don't know why they always stand like this, but they, these people, they came out the womb like, you know what I mean? I've met these people. They're great. I, we're fitting to die. So there's probably this talk. We should turn back. Now, if the boat could talk while it's eavesdropping in on this faithless conversation, we should turn back. The boat would probably, hey, excuse me, excuse me. Um, You're in the middle, which means if you go backwards, it'll take you the same amount of time, the same amount of distance, the same amount of effort and energy. Why would you want to go backwards when you could go forwards? Why would you trade your future for familiar? Why would you do that? Maybe you should just learn some lessons from the middle. You know what it says? The boat. What does it say? What was in the middle? The the what? The boat, right? It says the boat. Notice it never says the disciples were in this storm. It never says, and these men were in this storm. never says that. It says the boat was in this storm. Well, who put them in this boat? We'll go back to verse 22. And read it. It says, and Jesus made them get in this boat. He had to force them into this boat. Now, if I know Jesus, like I know Jesus, and I know the Lord really well, he didn't pick the most safe, secure, comfortable boat for them. He probably went down to the dock, the harbor, and went, too big, too safe, too easy. Let me tell you what he's really seeing. They won't pray in that one. They won't fast in that one. 
They won't worship longer in that one. Are you following me? I know this is messing with some people's theology, but the truth is, I'm not saying God is the God of hard times. I am saying that sometimes he entrusts you with difficulty because there is a growth and a breakthrough that's going to come on your life. God loves to be depended on. We have bought into a perhaps progressive thought or a, a progressive gospel that says, I'm only allowed good times. Everybody wants a victory, but how do you get one? A battle. Right? So... He's going down, he's going, too safe, too stable, too easy, this one. Y'all get in this one. Y'all get in this one. And Peter probably said, hey, uh, Lord, listen, I know you, carpenter, you don't work with water. You work with wood. I don't know if you know, there are holes in the boat. I know, get in this one. That one, half of it's in the water. I know, get in it. Get it, watch, get it, get in it. Right? Get, get in the boat. Get in the boat. Get in the boat, Right? They're probably like freaking out. This is why it says, and Jesus made them get in this boat. Now, you ever had your mama make you get something, make you do something? She said, get in the boat. Get in the boat. Get in the, get in the boat. Get in the boat now. Pedro, you better get in this boat right now. Right? You ever had that? Right? Has them get in this boat. Right? No doubt when they hit these storms, they're like, oh my gosh, we fit in the dark. And if the boat is here, this, he could interrupt. Oh, excuse me. Excuse me. He put you in me. So it must mean that you have somewhere to be because he would not have said it if he would not have allowed it. And he has put you in something you did not expect it to be the vehicle to get you to where you're at. But I promise you that marriage is worth fighting for. That vision is worth fighting for. That prayer life is worth contending for. It's worth prioritizing. It may not be how somebody else got there, but it's God's plan for your life. Learn to live in the middle. You know, I, I was fortunate enough to go on a cruise and uh, I asked some friends who'd gone on a lot. I said, hey, where, what should I do on the cruise? How do I? And, they, and, you know, all the people who are cruises, they're like CrossFitters. They're ready to tell you. It's like vegans. They're ready to talk about it, right? <laughs> so all these cruise people are just like, okay, now what you're going to do is. And I, they said, listen, when you, they said, when you, do, they, this is what they told me. I hope you hear me with spiritual hearing. I'm like, I'm about to go on this boat. I want to go on a cruise. What do I do? They said, well, depending on the time you want to set sail, will determine the price. And I heard it as, I heard it as, if you wait till it's easy, perfect, and comfortable, you'll pay a higher price. But if you don't mind water in your face and wind in your hair, you'll still get to where you're going and it won't cost you as much. Then they, they don't know that I'm actually writing this message and I'm hearing this. I said, what else? And they said, uh, they said, well, you want to stay on the lowest part of the boat. I said, the lowest, don't I want the view? They said, no, you want the lowest part of the boat. I said, I thought, I thought being higher. No, no, no. They said, no, you want to be on the lowest part of the boat. I said, why? And this is what they said. Because the lower you are, the less you feel. See, we've got social media telling us to outgrind, out hustle, outrun, outbuild, outdo everybody. And you're over here living on the top. But the truth is, there's so much turbulence. Your prayer life has no resistance against it. Your fasted life has no, if you do, doesn't have any term. So you're busy outdoing everybody else and trying to outshine everybody else. But you are feeling more than you should. And then for some reason, you blame God. When we are called to humble ourselves before the Lord, Jesus said, follow after me for I am low in heart, lowly in heart, which means humble. I am going to feel, why? Because the lower I am, the less I get to feel. Are you hearing me? Mark chapter 6, it's interesting. Jesus came walking on the sea, saw them struggling, and would have passed them by. I mean, I want to like, Windmill punch the air. What? What, you weren't even planning on stopping, sir? Failure to render aid in all 50 states? We out here almost drowning, and you just out here just enjoying yourself on the water and would have passed them by. Can I, God is not ignoring you. 
He is waiting on you. Because God wants to be depended on. My Bible says without faith, it's impossible to please God. He wants to be depended on. He wants to know that the bank account, no matter how many zeros, and if it's in black or red, so that's too real for some of us. He wants to know you'd still depend on him. He wants to know no matter what the report comes back this week, doctor's report, court reports, whatever it is, he wants to would you still depend on me? He wants to know that you, could, you can't be bought. Someone said, Pastor Chris, they asked me, Pastor Chris, how much is too much money? I said, whatever amount gets you to stop praying, stop believing, stop worshiping, what's fat, that's what you're worth. He's just too good. Which brings me to the last piece. If we're going to be born for the storm, number one, number one, walk where he tells you to walk. Number two, learn to live in the middle. Number three, answer. Answer the invitation. There is a lot of invites going out from heaven right now. I see a great transfer of wealth, especially, let me just talk church for just a second, church leadership. We have a generation that is going home to be with the Lord, and we don't have enough pastors and leaders to take their places, which is why for the last, I think, five and a half years, maybe more, five and a half years is my data, that we have closed more churches in America than we have opened every month. That's current. And perhaps, perhaps it's that, it's not the, the invitation does not get lost in God's mail. There are no porch pirates. Purpose pirates, but not porch pirates. No, no, what's happening is people are not answering because they want their invitation to be towards something else because they were nourished, groomed, developed to be this. And God said, but I, I, I knew you in your mother's womb and I've put it in you to do this. It's, no, th this one has more money to it. Yeah, but this one has blessing. Blessing of the rich, right? The blessing of the Lord maketh rich, add no sorrow. I know tons of millionaires and billionaires that have a lot of sorrow. And then I know people who have nothing but have joy that these guys can't get with their $1,000 therapists. Are you following me? There's something about answering the I'll never forget, <laughs> you know, when God started really putting us on the nations, and, and you and I were talking about this and last night. You know, our heart at Love Has No Limits is unite the global church for the salvation and transformation of nations. And Historically, what we would do, our footprint would normally be in nations other than America because we would mass mobilize these armies of missionaries to go in and saturate entire nations with what we call targeted intelligent outreach. And what we would do is we would work two years to bring the church and start working to unite the church and overcoming the church splits that happen, overcoming the offenses and overcoming the, well, their theological stance is this and yours is that. Great, but we all know that salvation only comes through Jesus. Let's find where we can work together, not find what separates. That's contract and versus covenant. Contract sets the terms on which we separate. Covenant sets the terms on which we stay together. This is why it's called a marriage covenant. This is why it's called a new covenant. Are you following me? Right? So we're working. And, and I, 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 I mean, I wish I had time to tell you uh, about uh, Peru was our last one. We brought 10,000 missionaries from 43 different nations, 150 plus organizations represented, to pound ground in the nation of Peru. I mean, we went into 3,000 high schools in five days, preached Jesus with an altar call and a follow-up campaign for anyone that made an eternal decision so we can plug them into discipleship and into the local church. I mean, we did 14 medical clinics in 12 different cities in soccer stadiums with 1,000 medical professionals. I'll never forget when the president said, you can't love our nation better than you, and he commissioned another 1,000 to come in and help. I mean, I, we did 47 city-wide water wells, not the village ones you normally see. Cities get fresh water. We took logging boats and turned them into medical triage centers and sent them down the Amazon River, and they went to the fingers of the Amazon River, and we watched as people who had never gotten care and aid and treatment were getting with those, that medicinal help, but at the same time, we watched legs grow out, eyeballs appear in sockets, deaf ears pop open, and souls come in. I mean, we did firefighters for Christ training, sports clinics, uh, spiritual leaders advances, political forums, education forums, and then we culminated into 10 stadiums on the same night at the same time, and we saw 1.1 million people give their lives to Jesus and... 
can still be found in a local church four weeks later because we believe in discipleship and those retention ratios have never happened. You want to know why? Because we don't put our name on anything. I don't even preach at it. I have done, we have done 70 stadiums and I've never stood in one, on one platform. Because we say it's, not a, it's time to lay down our labels, our logos, and our egos. And I am not here to ask the local church to platform me. When we're moving in these cities and nations, we're asking the church, can we platform you? And it's amazing how God can do the increase. We didn't advertise one name, not one man, not one band, not one woman, not one mandate. We always say it's about a mandate and a mantle, not a man and a woman. And we watched this incredible harvest. Then we were on a Zoom call with the vice, uh, vice president of Ecuador. And he said he was extending a national invite to us. As we ended this call, Dalton, the presence of God, boom, came on us. We were all on the floor in our conference room. God, what's going on? And God said, I'm reassigning this vision. We said, okay, Lord, where? He said, I want to make an aggressive move on America. We said, okay, Lord, where do you want to start? He said, Los Angeles. We're like, surely you mean Dallas. You meant Tulsa. Birmingham, somewhere in the south, somewhere Bible-friendly, ministry-saturated, not hostile to the things of God. God said, no, I want to start in L.A. because I want to produce a model that could perhaps, if it works in L.A., it'll work anywhere. And he said, I'm not going to cause my church to run to finishing lines. I'm going to run, cause them to run to starting lines. And this will be the beginning of a journey, not the end of a movement. And so I, I'm trying to make a long story short, but we said, okay, let's set a date. How many you know when God speaks in spirit, you don't respond in logic? <laughs> no, ask Zachariah. Hey, your wife Elizabeth's about to have a baby. And he's like, nah, she old. <laughs> she old, dusty, crusty, old, like extra crispy, old, old. And God, what does God do, remember? God speak in spirit, he responds in logic. And what does God do? Shut up. <laughs> and mutes him till the baby's born. Remember this? Why? Don't respond to spirit talk with logical thinking and talk. And so, so here, here, here we are. God says, all right, you're going to marry. We're like, okay, Lord, let's set a date. July 2020. <laughs> Come on, we all know what happened. Let's just be honest. March of 2020, everything went to a bucket of suck. <laughs> like it was just, nobody had a playbook, nobody had a strategy, nobody knew what to do, and we're in L.A. Great God, he's so <laughs> like you're even mad, but still had to say it. Like I, I remember, I'm, we're like God. We're clearly out of our depth. We're following the cloud. What do we do? You need to give us the keys that are going to unlock this city. He said, "All right, start by gathering all the churches." Right before we went into full lockdown in California, we watched as we gathered 552 senior pastors in a hotel ballroom. If you know anything about gathering people, that's one thing. Gathering senior pastors. You have to pray and fast for 20 months just to get that to happen, right? So we present this. It was amazing how the gift of desperation had already made its way throughout all their lives as we seeded an opportunity with sharing our heart, history, and a little bit of the vision. They said, this isn't something, unanimously, they said, this isn't something you should do. This is something you have to do, and you have to do this now. So we said, okay. Uh, we said, Lord, we got momentum. What do you do? He said, start by paying off medical debt. So we're like, oh, that's new. Okay. We just started finding as much medical debt. I'm happy to report. I'm making a long story short. In 12 months, we watched the Lord dissolve $47 million worth of medical debt for 23,000 people below the poverty line who got letters in the mail saying your medical debt's been eradicated, no strings attached. And if you need anything, contact Pastor Ward, who's 5.4 miles down the road because we geotagged them to a life-giving church participating with us within a 10-mile radius. Why? Because we're platforming the local church. Right? Then the Lord said, go after foster care. And we're like, I never knew about this. But I, I mean, Los Angeles has the largest foster care system in America. It has 40,000 kids trapped in the system right now. We just went in and said, what do you need? They said, we need leads of families. They spend millions of dollars a year on radio ads, TV spots, billboards, and they could generate maybe, maybe 100 leads in a 12-month cycle. We just said, okay, we don't have that kind of money, but we're just going to wake up the church to this, put fire on this vision. In 30 days, thousands of leads started to pour in and have continued to since 2021. We have continued to make such a dent 
that the Board of Supervisors would be the City Council of Los Angeles invited us to a special session, and they said, for years we have overlooked the local church and the faith-based uh, community. And what we're doing now is we have created policy and procedure that has kept you out of our dealings as leadership in the city. We are redacting all of it and we are creating four advisory positions for senior pastors only to come and tell us where the felt need is and the current crisis is so we can meet those people and help them. And the local church is the one who has the pulse on that. Friend, that's revival too. I know everybody wants to shake around on the ground, but it doesn't make any sense for us to have revival here and the people across the street have no idea what's happening. And sometimes it's better than, but what's better than holding a mic is open, holding the door open for somebody to come in and get a box of food because they haven't fed their babies in two weeks. And God says, all right, go after the prison system. We planted a, ch I'm making a long story short now. We planted a church in all 35 state penitentiaries in 12 months that was turned over to churches within a 10 mile radius of that prison as a local campus. Because we said when a convict becomes a convert, they need a community to continue establishing covenant with God both in and outside the prison. And we can break the generational curse of repeat offending if we get them in the prison and transition them well into the local church. Who would have thought? We hosted a historic men's gathering in the middle of a lockdown season when we were able to gather and we watched 100,000 men come out of that gathering and complete a 30-day Brave Code challenge to walk into authentic manhood and fatherhood because God said America needs its families back. Hello. Well, the only way we get our families back is if we get our fathers back. And the only way we get our fathers back is if we call them into authentic manhood and fatherhood. Biblical manhood Biblical fatherhood. We watched 100,000 men complete that challenge in L.A. That's revival too. Then it came to the stadium moment. This is all before the stadium. This is all softening the heart. I'm not even telling you about the 33 million pounds of food we shipped in every weekend. I'm not telling you about the uh, $10 million in GIK, which is goods and gifts in kind, which is like beds, dressers, fridges, clothing items, home goods that was distributed. I'm not talking about all the remodels, the rebeautification projects. I, have, I wish I had time. But then we get to this stadium moment, and God's like, all right, it's time for the stadium moment. Well, we put six figures down on the Memorial Coliseum, you know, the iconic Olympic stadium. They called us 48 days, no one's counting but me, 48 days before our date. And they said, we're sorry, we have to dissolve your contract. we like, why? They said, we have a neighboring stadium that's literally across the street who inked their contract before they, we did with you. And if we have two mass gatherings at the same time, it's going to break down the infrastructure. It's gonna, the infrastructure is going to collapse. The traffic will be a nightmare. It will back up all into the city. So now we have no stadium. Four hours later, four hours later, we get a call from SoFi Stadium, brand new Rams Chargers Stadium in Los Angeles. And they said, hey, we've been watching everything you're doing. We watched the food distribution. We watched the foster care. We watched the prisons. We watched all that you've been, they came, went through our whole vision. They're like, we tracked it all. And they said, we want to have our name attached to this purpose. They said, would you like to host your gathering in our stadium? This is four, after, four hours after we lost the first one. We were like, mm, yes. <laughs> I feel God about that. He's here. You feel that? We said, yes. And they, but we said, listen, but your budget was here. We talked to you before, remember? We walked it before. Your budget was here, and ours, we're a mission organization. Ours is down here. And then you said we were third right or refusal, which means we're third in line for the date we want and need. He said, no problem. We'll work with you on the budget. We had to sign an NDA. Nobody will ever get that price. Nobody. Just want to hold that up for God. Um, and then they said, we're going to call the first two people. Well, the first one they call, hey, Taylor Swift. Here's what's going on. The whole, you know, I don't know if you're this little tour she's been doing. Um, the, Hey, Taylor Swift, here's what's going on. And Taylor and her team hear our whole vision. And they said, Taylor, would you move your date? Which never happens in the industry. Taylor, will you move your date? She says, absolutely, I'll move my date. And Taylor moves her date. I became an instant Swifty <laughs> right there. I don't even know her music. My kids are like, Dad, you don't know who that is? I'm like, I, I don't know. I just know God was making a way. That's all I know right now. I'm so stressed out. Don't talk to me. <laughs> like... Then they called the second person. Hey, Kenny Chesney. They walk Kenny and his team through the whole, Kenny, will you move your date? These, have to, these answers have to come from them as the artist. Can you move your date? He's like, absolutely, I'll move my date. And Kenny moves his date. Then they called us, hey, love has no limits. <laughs> Do you want SoFi Stadium? We're like, yes, 100%, right? The next day we get a call 
Now that we got a stadium, we're like, okay, we're back on, what do we do? Well, the next day we get a call from some guys who, who founded a small music festival you might have heard of called Coachella. And they said, um, hey, we, uh, we've been watching everything you're doing. We've watched the foster care, we followed the food distribution, the medical debt dissolved, the prisons, we watched it all. We said, we've been tracking you and we want to have some, these are great Jewish men, they said, we want to have some purpose in our life like this too. Could we run all your audio, visual, lighting, and streaming capacity for you? Yeah. I feel, yeah. Yes. Yeah. You feel that? Right? Like, and they said, okay, who's the lineup? We said, well, we're really positioning a lot of great conversation right now. We'll be able to feed that list to you shortly. That's code four. We're praying, and we don't know. And they said, well, you have 30 days. You've got to circle back with us in 30 days in order for us to meet our deadlines with all our vendors and everything. I said, no problem. Well, like two weeks later, they called us. Pastor Matt. They were like, hey, uh, we're freaking out over here. Who's the lineup? We said, listen, we've really postured a lot of great opportunity here. And we're going to be able to seed that list to you shortly. That's code for we're praying and fasting now, and we don't know. We don't know. Like, come on, this is Los Angeles. The truth is, I can go, I can go get all the top Christian artists and worship leaders. The only people that come to that are Christians. And then I don't want to fill a stadium with people who already know the Lord, and then we take pictures of ourselves and feel good about ourselves, and we did nothing when we wasted all this energy, momentum, and this sacred timing that God has given us in this window. We said, let's get radical. Let's get wild with our strategy. Who is a tier one influencer, a global icon that's a Christian? Well, how many of you know that's a short list? That's a real short list, right? And then we said, well, who's... Who's all of that and not afraid to share their faith? So now we're like crossing names off the list. We're like, oh gosh, this list is getting real small, right? And who's that? All of the text checks all those boxes. And, and who will do it with us? And it came down, it could only be any, mini miny, Justin Bieber. So sure enough, we get to 30 days. The guys from Coachella call us and they're like, hey, listen, we're freaking out over here. We really need to know if we're going to meet these. We need to know who's the lineup. We hadn't have long. We said, listen, our history in the nations is probably showed you that we have a higher risk tolerance than most people in your industry. That's called faith. Um, we said, um, we know the miracle of giving God one more day. How many know Esther asked for one more day? We felt like they would understand that. Let's ask, can we believe God for one more day? They said, you have one more day. We're like, okay. Man, we didn't sleep at all that night. I'm telling you, I was praying in tongues in the fetal position in a paper bag in the corner of one of my house. I'm telling, like, in a room in my house. I'm telling, like, I was, I was like, oh, God, we're gonna, we're, 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 this is going to be fire Festival 2.0. But Christmas, I like, like I'm, I'm freaking out over everything, right? And all of a sudden, the next morning, around 9 a.m. Pacific Standard, we get a FaceTime from a number we don't know, and it's Justin Bieber. He said, uh, listen, I've been watching everything you've been doing. And he said, I've watched the food distribution. I've watched the, the, the medical uh, relief, uh, debt relief. I've watched the prisons. I've watched the foster care. I've watched the men's. I've watched all that you've been doing, all the aid, all the schools. He said, and God spoke to me this morning. And he told me that I'm supposed to stand with the church of Los Angeles. And I am supposed to use my influence across all of my social media and industry connections. And I am supposed to help you. He said, number one, can I serve you? And number two, can, if you don't have your lineup, can I help you build your lineup? We were like, Justin, anytime your friends want to be our friends, like, we Gucci with that. Like, we feel good. We feel God about that one, right? He jumps on another phone while we're sorting some preliminary details with his team on this phone call. He jumps on the phone and starts calling people. Hey, Chance the Rapper, I need you. Hey, Tori Kelly, I need you. Hey, Jaden Smith. He starts building a whole lineup the Coachella, guy, Coachella guys had never had. They called us, and they said, we were freaking out. Who's the lineup? We said, well, how do you feel about Justin Bieber, Jaden Smith, Chance the Rapper? And no lie, they, they, they said, no way, but there were some explicitives in there. <laughs> but I'm too much of a man of integrity to say it. So, like, I, they, and we were like, I, no way. And I was like, no, there's a way. Praise God, there's a way. You know? <laughs> and sure enough, they started posting this. It wasn't social activism or clicktivism. It was a social give back. Because this model is not about the found serving the lost. It now became the lost and found serving together on the campuses of local churches where they're rubbing shoulders with church staff and members. And that what it does, it drops a pin in their heart and in their brain where a life-giving church is, where they have relationship. Because the only way you can get to that stadium is if you have a wristband. We don't sell tickets. We don't take up offerings. We don't do any of that. We're, pri we're faith-funded. We're privately funded. 
We don't do any of that. And we watch as we begin to fill that stadium and we hit the stream. Half a billion people watch that one night and were touched by the gospel of Jesus Christ. Come on. That is happening in our day. Why am I sharing all this? There's an invitation for Maine. Why am I sharing all this? Perhaps you're dreaming too small. I love the church in every county, but that's practice. What if God wanted to put a Charleston church in every country? Can I just expand? What if he wanted you to unify North and South Korea? What if he wanted you to bring solutions to the Darfur crisis? What, what, if, what if? Just what if? There's invitations. This is interesting because Jesus is walking on the water. And all, all it's mind blown is what Peter's experiencing. Jesus is walking on the water. Lord, if it's you, command me to come. And Jesus says one word, come. I'm here to tell you, you just need one word sometimes. One anointed, authoritative, I'm talking about in-season, strategic word. He says one word, come. Now, I believe in the literacy of the Bible. I believe that, you know, if, if there were three Hebrew children in the fire and they didn't get burned, it didn't smell like smoke, they didn't smell like smoke. If Noah was, survived three days in a whale, he survived three days in a whale. If Jesus was dead for three days and came back to life, he came back to life. I believe in the literacy, literal meaning of the Bible. But... I believe Peter walked on water, but I also believe there was something under his feet, a little extra. Because when he walked, he wasn't defying science, physics, gravity. He was walking on an invitation. Come. You do realize that we, we have Jesus in two storms. There's this one here, Matthew, and Mark chapter 6. There's another one in Mark chapter 4. In Mark chapter 4, he rebukes that storm. The reason why we know that is because Jesus reads this as an unusual weather pattern. And so when he says, I rebu he rebukes the wind and the way, when he starts to rebuke it, that word in the Hebrew is only reserved when dealing with the demonic. So he knows that this storm in Mark chapter 4 was sent by the devil. He rebukes that storm. But in this one, he doesn't rebuke it. He walks on it. Which tells me there's storms that you should be rebuking and storms you have authority to walk through. Either way. You have authority over every storm. Perhaps there's people in this room, you're trying to rebuke a storm you should be walking through. And maybe you're walking through a storm you should be rebuking. We could shorten the brevity and the bandwidth of this toll that's taken on your heart and your spirit. But you have to understand you were born for any type of storm, any kind of storm. Would you stand with me this morning? I feel the presence of God in this room. I know I'm the long-winded preacher, but I felt to unload my heart this morning. Trust me, I got more in the tank for tonight. I don't want you to miss the opportunity to be here for Revival Sunday. Please, listen, there ain't no football on. Caitlin Clark will be done by the time 7 o'clock happens. I've already talked to her about it. Like, there's, trust me, there's no reason why. There ain't nothing going on in Charleston, all right? Just be here. I feel like God's in the room now. I just wonder if there's people who've got storms in their life. People who would say, Pastor Chris, you're speaking right to me. I, I want to walk on some storms, but I'm afraid to walk where he tells me to walk. And I want to learn the lessons from the middle, but I have a habit of starting and never finishing. Or, you know, I want to answer the invitation, but is it for me? All the promises of God. All the truth of the scriptures are for you. All of it. It is not a respecter of color of skin, race, creed, background, past, future, education level, financial status. All are called. All are given the same invitation. And I just wonder, perhaps there might be some people in this room, the greatest invitation you can get is not not the wedding, not the award ceremony. It's not the presidential visit to some palace somewhere else. It's not a dignitary. The greatest invitation that's ever been extended was on a cross. 
when Jesus died for my sins and your sins, it was an act as if God to say, I have now bridged the gap between man and me that they can now forget all of their past my grace and my spirit will come on them my word will guide them they will be a new creation because of what my son Jesus did and when Jesus rose back to life friend God hit sin so fast on that invitation it has been sent around the world and will not stop until his coming again there is an invitation right now. It's why you haven't fallen asleep. It's why you finally haven't gotten bored in church. It's why you are here this morning. It's why you would get out of bed out of no reason except maybe a friend invited you or you just felt, I need to go. The only reason is God's wooing you. His invitation is so pure. It's powerful. And I remember hearing this invitation. I was a messed up drug addict kid, full of anger because of my parents' divorce, full of perversion because I didn't have a man in my life to tell me how to handle myself and teach me honor and teach me integrity and teach me character. I didn't have any of that. I had no accountability. But man, when I gave my life to Jesus, anger fell off of me. Perversion fell off of me. I've been sober since that day, never had a touch of anything in my life. I'm telling you, I have a marriage I don't deserve. I have four amazing kids. I don't deserve. I get to do this. I'm living my dream. And I could care less who knows my name. I work really hard to stay hidden. While most, maybe most contemporaries want to be spotlighted, I'm like, put me in shadows because I can get into boardrooms, palaces, dignitaries, presidents a lot easier if I'm hidden. I'm telling you this because the promise for salvation is for you. I got news for you. Some of you are like, well, I got to get cleaned up first. I got to get polished. For no, God's not in love with a future version of you. He's in love with the you right now. And when God gets you, he knows everything he's getting. He knows all the pain and all the problems. And he, he knows all the struggle, but he knows all the strength. The prophetic destiny. He knows, he knows every issue, but he knows everything you're called to. And he still wants you and I. If you have never given your life to Jesus this morning and you want to turn away from that wickedness, from that sin, that addiction, that pain, you want to give your life to Jesus, finally surrender and make him not just Lord, Master, and ruler of your life. All three. If you want, he's going to be Savior, he's going to be Lord, he's going to be Master. If that's you, would you say, just bravely in, in our community right here, would you say, Pastor Chris, that's me. I'm giving my life to Jesus. I'm tired of the trash. I'm going after God this day. With the, who am I talking to today? Am I talking to anyone? Oh, and you're online too. I, I want to pray. I want to pray. I want to pray. Thank you. Church, would you pray after me and pray with some volume and say, Jesus, I give you my life. I thank you that you died for me, that you rose again, and you're alive today. I declare that I am yours. I am born for the storm. I'll walk where you tell me to walk. I'll learn the lessons of the middle. And I'm answering the invitation. I make you my Savior and my Lord. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. Come on, can we celebrate with those in the room and those watching online? Listen, we're going to come up and give you some instructions. If they're not already on the screen, just get ready. I want to do two things, and then we'll worship out, turn it over. I want to pray for those who have storms in their life. I want to pray for you. I, I wish I could tell you, you know, I'm a storm chaser. I have friends that do that. They've got issues. I, I can't, I, you know what it is? Storms find me. I, I, I feel like maybe something found you. You didn't expect that diagnosis. You didn't expect your baby to fall away from God and live in a wicked lifestyle. You didn't, you didn't expect the problems, the, 
the papers that you were served. You didn't expect that. Can I tell you something? It has never caught him off guard. You're born for it. You're ready because he's ready. And I don't know what the storms are. It could be your health. It could be a family member. It could be you dealing with the tragedy or the loss. It could be the uncertainty about your job. It could be, it could be anything. But I want to speak to storms this morning. I want to pray over those storms. We're going to rebuke storms that you should rebuke, and we're going to do it together. And then we're going to ask God for the grace and the strength for you to walk through storms you should be walking on top of. Can we do that? If that's you, say, Pastor, because i got storms in my life. Would you take your hand and put it, on my, put it on your heart? Father, in the name of Jesus, we speak to storms we have authority over. Lord, I speak to the storm over that physical need. Lord, over that, that, that healing over that renewing of the mind, over the emotional place of their life, God. And I rebuke the work of the devil. I rebuke every storm that has an irregular weather pattern attached to it. And I call breakthrough on your life. We tell that storm, you must go. Leave my family. Leave that body. Leave that neighbor. Leave this city. Leave our county. Go now in Jesus' name. We rebuke these storms. Father, I pray for my friends that they would have a supernatural awareness. They can walk over storms. I ask God that you would put an invitation right under their footsteps. That while everybody else thinks, man, you should be in pain, you should have depression, you should have issues, you should have a mental breakdown, you've got peace, you've got joy, you've got purpose, you carry hope, there's faith alive in your heart, renewed vision constantly coming to you. I pray for strength to walk over storms. Lord, I pray the invitation that you extended to Peter is being extended over the times of eternity to now. Come. I know it's safer in your boat. I know it's safer in your, in your, in your position. I know it's safer in your thoughts. I know it's safer in your opinion. But would you, would you like an impossible journey that the story would end up being had it not been for God? I declare healing. I declare breakthrough, I declare provision, I declare spiritual discernment and wisdom over you right now in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Can we thank God for just a moment? Come on.